So background, just to bring get everybody on the same page here, uh, the devil makes a bet with God that, of course, Job is a man of faith because he has everything he could possibly want. But if Job is squeezed hard enough, the devil believes, then um, Job will no longer believe. And God says, okay, if you think you can do that, go right ahead. And so much, so much of the good of Job's life was taken away. Children, property, animals, you know, everything that the, the world um, uh, proposed that would cause meaning in your life were taken away by accident or murder or illness, all of that, you know, plundering. So here he sits alone and he gets friends around him who all think they have an, a reason or an explanation for this. And then Job speaks. So what part of part of what we are going to hear on Sunday is part of what Job says. And I think um, I love the book of Job because kind of at the end of it, God speaks through this book. And essentially God says, you know, who are you? Just why all this? Why all this? Why all this? And it almost almost is reduced to God saying, because. You know, sometimes when you have a, a little child and they'll go, why, 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 why? Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? Just because, because I'm the mother, that's why. You know, so it almost ends like that. But Job has, um, has a lot of clarity, I think, in how he articulates this. So uh, I'd like to go through this first, through the parts of it. And this is called a biblical lament in which a complaint is made and then a request is asked, but always couched in trust for God's love. Because as we're going through this, I want you to note that the tone of this is not penitential. Like, oh, I'm a worm and no man, God, you know, and I know that, you know, you have the power and you can do whatever you want. That's not the tone of Job in this. The tone it, it instead is from a person who is accustomed to an untroubled relationship with God and appeals to that love that he believes God has for him. Now that this is going to have a significant message I think to say to our the, all of our prayer lives. But for a minute, let's look at some of the things that I have marked. So first of all, there are some um, scripture students of scripture who believe that the strong words he used, especially drudgery and assigned months of misery, refer to military service. And, and when you have to go, um, like maybe modern terms would be like on bivouac or on watch for a, an extended period of time. Some people think that's what is referred to specifically with these two words. But it's not the only ones used. Hirelings, slave is used. And then this this word remember is important because just a few chapters ago, earlier than chapter seven, just a few chapters ago, one of the friends of Job uses that very word. And um, what he says is, remember now, Job, innocent people don't die. Only the uh, ones that have done wrong are afflicted with death. And, and that same word right there, Hebrew, is now picked up by Job, but Job is using it to God. Remember, God, my life is like the wind. Okay, so this very short section of this very clear, the language is strong and it's very, very clear, um, and it's very compact, leaves us at a place after which I would like to bring, uh, bring us to a point that can be for our reflection as we, as we work in our hearts to make a place for this, to receive it, to we hear it on Sunday. It's so short, but it's so clear. I mean, and I think that is part of the message um, from this particular section for us to take as a, as a carry away. I think Job is perfectly clear and he doesn't try to soften anything. The words that I highlighted are strong 
words and he intends them as strong words. And look how he ends. I shall not see happiness again. My children have been taken from me. My property has been taken from me. My herds of animals, my crops, everything's been taken from me. I shall not see happiness again. Here's the point. Loss is part of the way of the world. But God remains regardless of if it's times of bounty or times of poverty, times of joy or times of grief, times of happiness or times of sadness. God's presence with us is not predicated on our lives and ourselves in our lives being content and full. And I think what we can take away from this is the honesty of Job. We are, I think we're careful with people we don't know as well regarding how we really are. So for instance, we could just be coming out of the doctor's office with news of a diagnosis that is grave for us, like uh, a cancer that is worrisome. But we get in the elevator with people and somebody says, hi, how are you? And you say, okay, how are you? You'd never say, oh my God, I just got this diagnosis and I have two years to live. You wouldn't do that, probably you wouldn't. But the person you would share it with where the per would be the people that you feel love you. And I think sometimes we're too careful in our prayers. I think we, we pray to God from where we want to be instead of where we are. And that's not helpful. I think all we have to do in order to be in communion with God is not wish we were at a different place interiorly. If you're full of complaints, complain. If you're full of anger, be angry. If you're full of hurt, be hurt. If you're full of doubt, be doubtful. If you feel empty, be empty before God. And, and instead of trying to pretend, you know, that, that we are whatever we think um, holy or more perfect is, bag that. Mm -hmm. If you're really tipped, then just be that to God and be honest about it. I have no idea what to do with this, God, but I'm so mad. I cannot even know what to do. Or God, I have no idea what to do with this or how you can speak to me in this, but my heart is broken. God, I have no idea what to do with this, but I'm not sure I believe anymore. I have so much doubt. I don't know what to do with that. But here, I think we, we move too quickly to wanting um, resolution and nice, pretty, neat packages, you know, and it isn't that way. Life isn't that way. I, I think what we're called to is to be honest. And before anything else, I think we're called to be honest with God. I'm scared out of my mind, God. I'm sad beyond anything I thought I could ever be, God. I am lonelier than I have ever been. Where are you? I think one of the takeaways from this very short reading is exactly that. We have to be with God where we are, not where we wish we were, or we're going to miss an awful lot of possibility of redemption. And I'm not here to say that then tomorrow, if you sit to be quiet, you'll feel better. Mother Teresa famously was found after her death to have suffered years of feeling that she wasn't sure she believed in God. And nobody knew it except her journal that she, and her spiritual director. I, I don't know when or how God will address it, but I do know this and I believe this with my life, that we have to be where we are or we will never have the communion with God that can be transformative. I think that's the takeaway from this. Now in the liturgy, 
right after this, look, I usually don't do this, but look what the responsorial psalm is. Right after that's going to be proclaimed Sunday, look what we're asked to proclaim. Praise the Lord who heals the brokenhearted. Okay, you can see this is the reason right here why that psalm was picked. But look at this. Praise the Lord for he is good. Sing praise to our God for he is gracious. Do you hear what we're going to be singing on Sunday coming right after this? And that's the re this is the reason I'm trying to say, yes, in the midst of anger and loneliness and doubt and emptiness and pain and, and all of that and sadness, yes, we are pulled immediately to praise because even in the midst of all that, God is still good. You know, there's something magnificently powerful in the tradition of the African-American um, people who will say every time they gather, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Hear that? That's a whole theology right there. That is power, and that is realizing that God's goodness is not contingent upon my experience. God is just good all the time. And the faith that could own that through everything that they endured is precious, I think, in the eyes of God. So this whole psalm, look, and look what it, this whole thing is positive. First, the first strophe here, positive, positive, positive. And then look, he touches a little bit here, the psalmist, on Job's feelings of brokenheartedness and woundedness. But look what is brought into it. By name, right here, by name, by name, by name, by name, by name. If you never, if you forget everything else in your life, don't ever forget this, that God hold, calls you by name and holds you in the palm of God's hand. And that is true regardless of sadness or despair, all this other stuff, doesn't matter. That remains true. I can believe that. Okay, now let's go to the gospel. Very short, still in chapter one, there's so many miracles happen in the first chapter of Mark. So this is all happening in chapter one of Mark. Last Sunday's miracles happened in the synagogue. Now look what's gonna happen. They're gonna leave the synagogue. He goes um, to the house of Simon and Andrew, you'll remember their brothers, and Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. Two things here. First of all, this whole pericope, this whole small story in Mark's gospel um, is, um, is not just packed with, uh, with the miracles, but it, it talks about the relation, it uses what happens with two and with a very small group to break out and reach everybody. Okay, so. He leaves the synagogue and he goes into the house of, of Simon. All right, now all of this, scripture scholars believe there's too much detail not to believe that this actually happened. There, there's too much personal eyewitness details. So most scripture scholars think this actually happened because we're invited into, um, into kind of the privacy of the home and, this, and specific words are are used okay so um mother-in-law that's the first thing i want to say before i talk about fever okay now this is again a cultural thing okay so in first century palestine peter's mother-in-law should be living in her husband's house peter's mother-in-law that's his wife's mother should be living with his wife's father if she's not, then she should be living with one of her sons. If she's not, then she should be living with a cousin or someone in her bloodline extended family. If she's not, she's with Simon, who's an in-law, which means she is there because she has no one. Her challenge is more than just her fever. Her challenge in first century Palestine to be alone 
without anybody bloodline to care for you is a fate worse than death. Okay, so just that's cultural piece there. That's why at the crucifixion, Jesus gave Mary, his mother, to John, his apostle. There was nowhere else or no one else to care for Mary. And he wanted to be sure she was cared for. There was this protocol that would happen. But remember, marriage was, um, you went with the husband's family. So the, the bride would be gotten from her home and brought to her husband's family's camp and live with them. It was always to the male, to the husband. Okay, so that's the first thing. So I just wanted you to understand she's alone. Now, she's not alone because she's living with Simon and Andrew, but she's living with Simon and Andrew because nothing else is available to her. And that's a point of shame in first century Palestine. Okay, then fever. This is the Greek word. This is the transliteration of it. You see this first part of the word here, pyre. So you know that that means fire, right? Pyromaniacs like to start fires. In India, uh, people are not buried. They are burned on funeral pyres. Okay, so this word means, look at this, it's not a noun. Look at this, it's a participle, fevering. It is connected, therefore, to the verb, to the act of being on fire. So you could say Simon's mother-in-law was in bed on fire. Now, here's, uh, here's something odd. Usually in Mark's gospel, he was specific about what was wrong, but fever up here, this is not specific. You can get a fever for many reasons. And that's unusual. Mark usually says he was a leper. She was bleeding. He was blind. She was lame. You know, very specific. This is not specific. And the right translation is connected to the verb. So Simon's mother-in-law lay sick in bed burning. Okay, now, what was she burning about? Well, it could have been a disease, right? It could have been she was fevering with a bacterial infection. But use your imagination here. What if she was burning up, not physically, but emotionally about something? I don't know what it could be, it doesn't say, but use your imagination. What if she's burning up emotionally because Simon has left the family business and is going off with Jesus and what's going to happen to her daughter? She could be burning up emotionally about that. Then something happens and she changes. I like to think in my imagination that something about his interaction with her made her change her way of thinking. Like, well, I do sense something about this guy. Maybe my son-in-law's not so crazy after all. Now, look what happens here. They immediately told him about her, and these three things are really important. Approached, grasped her hand, helped her up. Approached, grasped her hand, helped her up. And those three actions must be kept together. This is why. If we do one of those, now I'm talking about us now. If we in our lives who approach people, help reach, reach out, grasping hand is reaching out, and helping people, if we do one of those and forget that they're part of this, all that, if we align what we do with what Jesus does, then they're connected to all these three things. If we focus on one without the other, then we forget that our service is connected to a much larger love. So these three, approach, we move to people, we reach out, and we help. If, you, if your focus is ever too much on one, like all the time, I'm going out to them. Nobody ever comes to me to ask me how I am. Uh, I help all the time and that she never listens to me. And I tell her what to do and I bring her supper and, and all of this and she never listens. If we focus on one, 
without remembering all three in this Jesus action, we're going to get tripped up and forget that whatever we do in the name of Jesus is always connected to a much larger love. That is a very powerful thing in this one small sentence. And the reason that I um, highlighted this right here, as you can imagine, another translation of this is raised her up. And the word Mark uses for raise is the very same word that Mark uses for Jesus being raised from the dead. Waited on them. This is the Greek word right here. That is this right here. Okay, now, can you see in the transliteration that that word looks very much like the word for diaconate or deacon? Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, that is what this word means. She began to minister. So I, I have seen this little section of this pericope. Lots of things have happened with this and it's gone from uh, well, well here let me let me tell you first i thought oh of course he'd make her better so that she could get up and serve them because wasn't he just like all men then they sat down and they wanted to have dinner i've, <laughs> I've read that i've also read especially coming out of this that she in fact went on to have a leadership position in the early church and her service was an extension of her ministry as being a woman leader later on in the early church. That broadened my thinking a little bit. But the third thing I wanna tell you is what most scripture scholars uh, say about this. The fact that she waited on them, really it just points to the completeness of her healing and her cure. And that was the point of Mark. It wasn't that she was being subservient, nor was it that she would go on to become a, a leader in the early church, in the apostolic church. It just was saying she was completely better. And in this, uh, in this short sentence, that's what was being said. Now, let me go on to this. Okay, I underlined this because um, you might remember that on the Jewish Sabbath, no work would be done. And that many times in the gospels, Jesus would be confronted by the Pharisees after he had cured someone on the Sabbath who would face him with, no, wait a minute, you know, that, that's really work. You can't cure those people on the Sabbath. That's really work. Okay, that's why I'm highlighting this. After sunset, the Sabbath is over because the Sabbath goes from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. So now what's going to happen is, look what I highlighted. Now it's not just going to be a few people that Jesus interacted with at the synagogue or Simon's mother-in-law inside of his home. Now, in fact, it's going to be all. So what started out small, now it's going to become universal. That's the movement Mark wants us to see. What starts out small with people that Jesus interacts with in an intimate setting never is intended to remain intimate, but is intended to move out and become universal. That's really, really important. And then this goes, what I underlined here goes back to what we talked about last week. The demons knowing Jesus is not confessing him as Lord, but trying to name him because when you could name someone, you could control someone. You remember last week, that's why Jesus said, quiet, don't you name me, be gone. So you almost think, what is it with Jesus and all these demons? This is the second weekend in a row that, that there's demons, you know? Well, I think there's two things Mark is, is trying to get us to see. Um, you can understand truth or I should say discipleship. You can understand discipleship in a way that's it's too narrow or too isolated. And I think the demons help us to understand this. So for instance, um, too narrow. The demons can know who Jesus is 
and want to override him by calling out his name. And yet that knowledge is too narrow because knowing Jesus doesn't help them then know who they are and how they should be. That's a narrow knowledge. It also can be too isolated as it is for the demons. Um, the, the demons know who Jesus is, but they have no desire to be in relationship with him. They just want to be stronger than he is and control him by calling his name. And that's a danger, I think, for us, for truth and discipleship and knowledge. Our, our grasp of those things can be too narrow and too isolated, and we always have to work um, at that not being the case. Okay, then um, this is the end of the pericope. Notice he gets up before the sunrise and he prays. Now, what has been happening um, in Jesus' life all through the Gospels is if you look at it in a certain way, in difficult times, read stressful times, Jesus would often go by himself to pray. Overwhelming times, difficult times, exhausting times, stressful times, he would go to pray to tap in to that communion that he always had with his father. So he's off by himself. That's why I noticed the word is deserted. But who comes to find him? Simon and everybody who was with Simon. Now, this is interesting because probably who is met by this is Andrew, James, and John, the other people named at the beginning of the pericope. But notice Mark is very deliberate about this. And don't miss the point of this. Jesus, I mean, Mark, could have said Simon and the disciples, but he doesn't. He, he goes out of his way not to say disciples because they're not acting as disciples here. Simon is saying, everyone's looking for you. Like, you know, okay, let's go back. You have a lot more people to heal. This is great. This is a great gig. You know, come back and let's just keep on moving. Let's keep on going forward. So Mark deliberately does not call them disciples because it's Mark's way of putting them down in how they are with Jesus now, because how they are with Jesus now is in opposition to um, Jesus. And in, in, in fact, and this is another thing, this translation looking for is actually a very specific Greek word, which means to seek for someone in a misguided way, or sometimes an evil with an evil intention. Now we don't ever get that. We don't get that by just reading, oh, everyone's looking for you because it's kind of benign, you know, and all that, but it's, it's very strong. There, Mark is very terse and he, he packs everything, you know, packs everything close, but it, it's like the pressure of it is pow, because everything's said with, very few words and very deliberately chosen words. Mm -hmm. And so look what Jesus does. Instead of going back with them, he says, no, you know what? I, I have been praying. I have been praying. I have been in communion with my father to ke keep my head on straight. And I was not sent here to keep hearing. What I was sent here to do was to preach. And nothing can stop that. Miracles will help for people to accept and believe my preaching, but the miracles are not the point. Okay, now, a couple things here that we can take away. First of all, if Jesus knew he couldn't do everything, don't you wonder why sometimes we think we can? That was part of the reason for him to plug into that communion between him and his father. Um, Anything that happened as a healing came out of that same communion in him, but it was subservient to the preaching. It was subordinate to the preaching, which was his ministry. His main purpose was to preach the good news and to gather a group of converted people who would live according to these values and bring the kingdom as they lived into the future. That was Jesus' point. 